murder, disappearances, conspiracy, all things I love to consume. But that is what we are talking about today, my sweet, sweet, beautiful, sick children. Because if you clicked on this video, you are just as sick and messed up as me, and I love you for it. But you know what? You're just curious. You're curious, and I think you're smart. If you if you clicked on this video, we're smarter than everybody else, okay? And we're interested. We're interested in psychology and how people's minds work and how people are capable of doing these up things. We're just gonna dunk and shit on this piece of shit we're talking about today, which is Dean Coral. Coral! 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 I'm sorry, I can't say Dean Coral without thinking about that. Anyway, today we are talking about Dean Coral, a serial killer that was active between 1970 and 1973 in Houston, Texas. But he was also known as the Candyman. Nope, not that Candyman. Nope, not, not that Candyman. This Candyman. Yes, we will be talking about this waste of oxygen today, but his story is very interesting because I actually didn't know about it. And I feel like I know everything about every serial killer because I do really love studying and watching true crime. And most people don't know about Dean Coral because he was overshadowed by another serial killer, which most of you will probably know as John Wayne Gacy, who was apprehended four years later in 1978 with a murder count of 33, whereas Dean Coral had only killed 29 boys, but most likely even more. And he also did that with the help of two accomplices, David Brooks and Elmer Wayne Henley, whom he was also murdered by in 1973. So let's get into the up tale of Dean Coral and the 29 murders he committed with his two accomplices. So let's go Mach 5 down the highway, unbuckle your seatbelts and slam on the brakes because we're about to bust through this windshield and deep dive into this story. Let's get to it. Let's <laughs> leave it in. So like I said, Dean Coral, otherwise known as the Candyman, was an American serial killer who was active between 1970 and 1973, who murdered and murdered 29 boys in and around Houston with the help of two teenage accomplices, David Brooks and Elmer Wayne Henley Jr. But let's go back to the beginning when this piece of shit was born. It was December 24th, 1939, Christmas Eve, the day before Jesus was allegedly born and when Satan was, otherwise known as Dean Coral. It was in Fort Wayne, Indiana on a cold winter's night when Dean's mother Mary, no, not that mother Mary, gave birth to Dean Coral alongside his father, Arnold Edwin Coral. I love these names. Now, I wanna preface that all the info that is available about Dean's upbringing has come from his mother and his mother alone because Dean was not discovered as a murderer until he was murdered in 1973. And his mother was, let's just say, a tad bit biased. And by bias, I mean until her death, she thought that Dean was innocent even though he was proven guilty. And she thought Dean walked on water not unlike Jesus Christ. So I think we have to analyze his upbringing with a little bit of skepticism and assume she's leaving out some major details Details, but even then, his upbringing still is super fucked up and makes a lot of sense that he was who he became, if that makes sense. But either way, let's get into it. So Dean was known as a very solitary child. He didn't like to hang out with older kids and pretty much kept to himself at all times. Red flag number one. But Mary said that this stemmed from an incident when he went to a birthday party as a child where all the other children got a prize of some sort, but Dean didn't receive any. Boo fucking boo. But this made Dean very upset and just kind of become a recluse and seclude himself from the other kids because he didn't want to get his feelings hurt. He didn't want to get his feelings hurt. Instead, he just wanted to hurt other children. <gasps> it all makes sense now. So for all of you that don't like kids in this generation just getting handouts for doing nothing, the ones that don't will kill your children, turns out. I'm kidding. And from my research, I know that Mary was a narcissistic, coddling, helicopter type parent, and his father was verbally and physically abusive to Mary, and it wouldn't surprise me if he was also abusive to Dean Coral and his younger brother. There's no information that we have that says he was, and Mary said, no, no, he never touched the kids. I feel like he probably did, but we don't know that for sure. So this is just the, all the f***ed up ingredients going into the serial killer pot of stew, okay? And it just gets worse from here. So early on in Dean's childhood, his parents moved to Houston, Texas and got divorced twice because sometimes once just isn't enough. And after their second divorce, Dean was sent to go live with his grandmother in Indiana for a summer where he worked on her farm. And this is where Mary said that he got quote unquote, all the sexual education that a boy needed. 
What? What? So basically, at 10 years old, mind you, Dean was, he was just watching animals copulate on the property. So his whole sexual education was donkeys and pigs bumping uglies, consensually and most likely unconsensually. What could go wrong? But when Dean was 14, he and his mother and younger brother moved to Vidor, Texas. Now, Vidor was a fun little town that was known as a sundown town. Sounds nice, doesn't it? It's not. That refers to a town that has signs put up to warn African American people that they can't be caught in the town after nightfall. This wasn't that long ago. So this town was just littered with psychopaths, degenerates, and racists. It's basically a town just riddled with hate. A perfect breeding ground for a serial killer? And a reporter at the time, Sally Bigsby Defty, love that name, described the town as quote unquote, essentially the kind of place where the big event for the kids is to pour kerosene on a cat and light it on fire. I don't know, maybe try cow tipping like the rest of us small town farm folk and not use Mr. Whiskers as a romaine candle. They say romaine candle, Roman candle, romaine candle. <laughs> that sounds fancy as just some food for thought. So to be in a town where kids are just setting animals on fire as a pastime is just a recipe for disaster. For the loner, no gold star child, Dean Coral. And Dean, wouldn't you know it, fit right in. As a teenager, he would often target the local flying squirrel population by trapping them, torturing them, and then killing them, and then either putting them on a necklace to wear around town, or just shove them in his cowboy boots and take him to school. Red flag number two two or five, I don't even know, I don't know. I'm not gonna keep count, red flag. But besides disemboweling squirrels, Dean had other pastimes, which included playing trombone in his school musical marching band. What a fucking loser. And candy. Dun, dun, dun. Because Vidor, Texas would become the birthplace of the Coral Candy Company. And this all stemmed from a local pecan, 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 I don't know, pecan salesman that came by Mary's house, Dean's mother, and noticed that Mary was making pecan pies. And he said to her, hey, you should probably make your pies on your own and sell them yourself. It could be very lucrative. And Mary thought, well, that's just a swell idea. So she packed up both the kids and moved on over to Houston and went to a candy factory where she would buy a praline recipe for a whole $50. And that's when the Coral Candy Company started. And Dean, always wanting to impress his mother, soon took over operations. He'd run the machines, he'd put the candy into boxes, and he would also deliver them. So this kid's life revolved around dead squirrels, trombone, and candy. If those aren't the final ingredients in the cereal killer stew, I don't know what the fuck is. <laughs> Just kidding, if you play trombone, it's fine. But if you're killing squirrels, get help. So after high school, Dean returned to his grandmother's farm in Indiana. You know, where he got his sexual education and got a job at a coil factory. And this is where Dean almost exclusively started hanging out with only children. Red flag number we don't know. His regular playmates were a pair of sisters that lived down the road from him. And Dean used to make innocent eight millimeter videos with them where he would make them recreate mock operations with chickens and their entrails that were in the replacement of real organs. Cause that would be bad. Not the dissecting chicken part of it with little girls. Now, nah, all the adults in this situation are just like, hmm, that's strange, but he's a nice kid, so it's it's fine, it's fine. Like everybody just brushed it off, which is just so concerning. But I guess in the times, people just didn't give a fuck about kids. I mean, people barely do now, I don't know. And it's also interesting because Dean actually had like a zero crime record through his teens and into his early and mid twenties. And everyone would describe Dean as quote unquote vanilla, which we will soon find out is the biggest misconception known to man because this man was a shit mix of flavors, none of which involved vanilla. But at the age of 20, 24, Dean was drafted into the army where he served as a radio repairman in Fort Hood. And this is when a friend of Dean's in the army would say that this is the time where Dean would have his first homosexual relations with another man. I don't think you could have homosexual relations with another anything, but all right, thank you, Dean's friend. But that would happen very quickly because Dean only lasted in the army for less than a year because his mommy phoned up and said, hey, Dean, I need you to come back and help me with the candy at the candy factory so you can't be serving time anymore. And they let him off with an exemption. So this guy's now a veteran of some sort. And when he went back to town, his mom had plopped the Coral Candy Company right across the street from the local elementary school. So I know that this is your demographic, Mary, but it's also your sons. So Dean, more than happy to be back, just went right into working at the Coral Candy Company. And he would be calling the kids over from the elementary school, handing out free candy that was spoiled. 
shirt and making friends with the kids otherwise known as grooming. And this is where this would all start to spiral into him grooming and making friends with kids and start to make relationships with them in order to take advantage of them in later years. Dean was a smart person. He he knew what he was doing and he played that long game because as far as we know, he was not killing kids yet. He wanted to cover all of his bases and make sure that all the parents that gave a shit knew that he was just the innocent candy man. I couldn't do anything. I'm giving kids candy. But in reality, he was plotting. He was, he was plotting. So Dean is working at this candy factory, having loads of kids come and get candy all the time. And he thought, hey, Hey, why not make a little hangout place? So he would put a pool table in the back of the factory where kids would come and use it and hang out with them. And this is also around the time where the people that worked at the factory, the adults that worked at the factory, noticed that, quote unquote, Dean wasn't all that interested in women, come to think of it, but he really liked hanging out with the little boys that came through. Red flag. Okay, let's not, okay. <laughs> but they would also say, quote unquote, but he was a nice guy and a hard worker and he didn't seem to be doing anything too terrible. <laughs> so <laughs> what the f so anyway, all the adults that worked within this candy factory just kind of pushed his weird behavior aside and shoved it under the rug and didn't address it at all. And after a couple years of the candy factory being established, it would be filled with young boys, either hanging out or actually working at the facility. Because child labor wasn't really a thing back then. But none of these boys actually reported any shenanigans or inappropriate behavior happening within the factory itself. Mostly, I think, because they were scared to say anything or Dean had groomed them to the point of not feeling comfortable nagging on him because he was like the cool place to hang out. And if they were to rag on him about something that he was doing inappropriately, they would lose that place. And in a town like Vidor, Texas, where there's nothing to do, I think Dean had built this kind of perfect scenario for himself. This was also around the time Mary, Dean's mother, went through her third and fourth divorce with her third and fourth husband. And it's crazy how a narcissistic, delusional, oblivious mother Money crazed child neglecting woman can't keep a husband. It is just beyond me, I tell you what. But the stresses of Mary's divorces would lead to the Coral Candy Company going under. So Dean was forced to take a day job at the Houston Lighting Company. And Dean's mother moved to Colorado based on the advice of a psychic. So that fits the bill to be honest. And this would end up being one of the catalysts that sparked Dean Coral's reign of terror. And he conveniently moved to a shed across the street from the Cooley Elementary School, the same school in which the Coral Candy Company was across the street from. How convenient. And he would pimp this place out. I tell you what. He installed a black light, a TV, a stereo, and a primitive alarm system that would flash a red light in his bedroom anytime anybody came close to the shed unannounced. So this guy essentially made every 1970s teenage boy dream party hangout dungeon. So he knew exactly what he was doing. And to be honest, if I was a kid, I probably would have checked this place out because it sounds pretty dope. It's terrible to say, but it's true. I grew up in a little smart farm town, you know, this place sounds like the most lit place. But you can see how like he, he built this place to be a teenage hangout. Like, hey, come into my bedroom. There's red lights that flash and it's super cool and kinky. I mean, cool. And uh, you should probably come into my bedroom and then have your friends come over and we can see the lights flash. What the? Anyway, this guy was sick. We already know this. But a lot of teenage boys did visit this place and a lot of which would just report saying it was a cool hangout. A lot of them would remember having pretty fond memories there. But some would recall Dean, quote unquote, getting a little too giddy around all the little boys that came in. But he was a nice guy all around. See this pattern that's happening? He gets a little too close to boys, but he's nice. So it's fine, not fine. But as far as we know, the first couple years when Dean was living alone, he did not murder any kids, which we don't know for sure, but we'll talk about that later. But it was when he recruited his first accomplice, David Brooks. Now, David Brooks was from a broken home and had known Dean since he was 10 years old, back when Dean was giving out candy to all the children of the neighborhood. So he had worked on Dean for this now being four years, just grooming him and having a relationship with him before he started to take advantage of him. And Coral would start taking advantage of him when he was 14, giving him five to $10 for low jobs. Brooks received and Dean giving. And according to Brooks, after being apprehended in 1973, he would say that Dean was the first man to ever accept him for who he was because Brooks' father despised him in every way, shape, and form and would often abuse him as well. So Dean kind of filled that fatherly role. 
if you will, but would end up taking advantage of that and taking advantage of Brooks. But less than a year after Dean and David's first encounter, he would end up moving in with Coral and soon become one of the two accomplices of Dean. And it would all begin on December 1970 when David would end up walking in unannounced on Dean Coral, two young boys who were tied to Dean's infamous torture board. Now this board was a seven by three foot unpainted slab of wood with four holes drilled into each corner, handcuffs being at the top for wrists and nylon rope being at the bottom for ankles to be bound. And the boys would be tortured and and then eventually murdered either by strangulation or by a pistol shot to the head. Again, this guy is a piece of shit I hope is burning forever in hell. I don't know how many times I can mention that, but I hate him so much. So when Brooks walked in on Dean and these two boys, he turned around and walked straight out, but would only be gone for a few days and inevitably come back because he really had nowhere else to go and he had no money. And then Dean's explanation for why the boys were there was just because they were part of a sex child free ring. No big deal. I just shipped him off to another state. You don't need to worry about it. And then David was like, yeah, all right. What? 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 Not too long after, Dean would admit to David that he was and killing children and would offer him the opportunity, getting a whole $200 to recruit boys for him to take in and have Dean and kill. And for David, I mean, he was making no money at the time and he didn't really give a shit. So he said, yeah, sure. And the partnership and plan were cemented. So Brooks was not only dependent on Dean emotionally, which was very obvious, but now also financially. He would also buy Dean a 68 green Corvette for his 16th birthday to buy his loyalty. So this kid was just brainwashed to, to, to every extent. It doesn't make him good, but it's just, it's just a terrible situation all around. Not to mention the guilt of already witnessing Dean seeing these kids and then not saying anything and then other atrocities down the road. It's like he just kept digging himself a hole and he couldn't get out. So the first murders that we know David participated in were those of James Glass and Danny Yates. Now Glass was already a friend of Brooks and had already been in Dean's shed multiple times along with a lot of other of his victims down the road. So he was already comfortable around Dean. There wasn't any red flags for him and Yates was just a friend of Glass's. So it was like a friend being like, hey, do you want to go over to this guy's house? I've known him for years and he's super cool. And this guy was like, yeah, sure. So it's like not enough red flags for these kids, unfortunately. And to prepare for the disposal of these two boys, Dean had rented out a dirt floor storage facility just a few months before. And it was conveniently located less than a mile away from where Dean worked. So he would just end up dumping some of these bodies on his way to work. Some people get Starbucks, Dean dumps bodies. So six weeks after that double murder, Brooks and Coral lured another couple of kids, 15 year old Donald Waldra and his 13 year old brother, Jerry to Dean's place, where David would look on as Dean sold both of these boys to death. And a couple months after that, Brooks would convince another one of his 15-year-old friends, Randall Harvey, stop being friends with David Brooks, by the way, to let him and Dean give him a ride to work in his white windowless Acaline van. Red flag number infinity. What? 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 There's just, that, uh, uh, na, there's a flag, all right? I guess they didn't know about the white vans yet back then, but my God, candy, white van, and creepy man. Anyway, now this van was one of Dean's torture chambers. Rings and hooks protruded from pegboards on the walls. And when the cops would search the van after Dean Coral was murdered in 1973, they would find binoculars, a two-way radio, and 15 feet of nylon rope. Now, after they secured Randall in the back of the van, they took him back to Dean's place where Coral would rape, torture, and eventually shoot Randall in the head with a pistol. And that is when they would take Randall's body and bury it in that dirt floor facility out by Dean's work. I'm just wondering who works at this facility. Like these guys are just coming in with a bag that maybe looks like a body and then coming out with a bag that doesn't look like a body and they're all sweaty and dirty and it smells like a dead body. But I don't know, nobody's getting raised that works here. That's all I'm saying. Something should happen, but nothing does. So let's continue. But Brooks maintains to this day that he never actively participated in the actual murders of the boys. His only job was to capture and dispose, which is still and terrible, dude. Now, Dean was killing months before David came on board. His first victim that we know of was a University of Texas student by the name of Jeffrey Conan, who was picked up hitchhiking on September 25th, 1970. Don't hitchhike ever, okay? Don't hitchhike ever. 
But what's interesting is that when they discovered Jeffrey's body buried, it was covered in a layer of lime and his body was encased in plastic wrap. So it was under the assumption that this was not Dean's first murder. And some other evidence that suggests that is that Jeffrey was also found gagged with cloth in his mouth and both his hands and feet tied together while also being naked. So between the process, detail, disposal, and execution of this murder, it is pretty obvious that Dean was already a seasoned killer at this time. There's even speculation that Dean had multiple associates or assistants before David and Henley came along as well. And he would just kill them if they weren't good enough, basically. Now, after Randall, Coral and Brooks would commit another double murder, and all six of these boys lived within the same 2.5 square mile radius in the same neighborhood. So in this town and in these days, kids would just run away a lot. Like it wasn't uncommon. And a lot of these parents just didn't really care or they just assumed they ran away or they were just difficult kids so they didn't care or they just couldn't afford them. So it wasn't of the utmost importance that these parents find these kids. But that wasn't the case for all of the parents. I don't want to put any of the blame on the parents. But this did make Dean's job a lot easier working in this small space because nowadays that just just would not be a thing but in these days, it made Dean's hobbies a lot easier. And also, the missing persons department in Houston didn't actually look for anyone. Their sole purpose was to inform families if they happened to come across them or if they already were arrested or dead. So the missing persons department's lacking in that department, let me just say that. It uh, was just basically, oh, you're missing? Well, hope he shows up. I don't know what to say about that, Stacey. Like, what the f but victim nine and 10 would not go unnoticed. David Hillegeist and his neighbor Gregory Winkle would go missing May 29th, 1971. And the Hillegeist family pulled out as many stops as possible as a poor family could back in those days. And after receiving absolutely zero help from the cops, they went to a PI that they would hire to investigate their son and neighbor's disappearance. And the only lead that the PI would find was that they might have been abducted by a guy named Chicken Joe in Dallas. Alice? But that trail ran cold really fast and they really got nothing out of the PI. And the most f***ed up part is that the police found out that this family was hiring a PI and they took this PI to court to make sure that his credentials were legitimate. So they spent thousands of dollars and weeks prosecuting this man and wouldn't spend a second or a penny looking for any of these kids. I know it's different times, but goddamn, you are f***ing useless. And I can say that because none of them are working now and probably most of them are dead, so. Chill. So the Hillegeist family, essentially out of all options after this, just plastered the cities with David Hillegeist's face. And the whole neighborhood pitched in, but none more than one of David Hillegeist's oldest friends, Elmer Wayne Henley Jr. And while Wayne would not know that Dean had killed his friend at the time, within six months of David's disappearance, Wayne would become Dean's second assistant and assist in another 18 more murders that would take place over the course of less than a year. So Wayne was actually originally supposed to be one of Coral's victims, fitting his victim profile to a T. But for Wayne Henley early in life, he had a relatively rough one. His mother was very strict and his father was an abusive drunk, which was honestly not that uncommon back in the day, but didn't give any excuses for what he did in later days. But his father left when Wayne was in junior high, and he also got into a lot of trouble with the law at a young age, doing breaking and entry, assault with a deadly weapon, and he was a hardcore teen teenage alcoholic. So these are just, just stirring that pot, stirring that pot of trouble. You know what I mean? But what's a lot different about Wayne than David and Coral is that Wayne was known as a popular guy. Charismatic, people just loved him. Everybody described him as just an all around cool guy, which would end up being the perfect accomplice attribute for Dean in later days. Because David was bringing in victims for Dean, but most people didn't really like David Brooks. People would describe him as kind of off off-putting and quiet and shy and overall just didn't want to be around him. That's an awful description of somebody, but I digress. So Dean Coral, seeing an opportunity, approached Wayne about joining his little f 
step trio and recruit boys for cash. And it did not take Wayne long to start assisting Dean in these crimes of recruiting, torturing, murdering, and burying these boys. And Wayne would help murder these boys as well. And in 1973, when Wayne would speak to police, he kind of came up with a bunch of excuses as to why he would do this. But Wayne's first lure for Dean was 17-year-old Willard Branch. Wayne said that he and Coral picked up the boy and took him back to Dean's apartment with the promise of getting baked and drunk, which what teenage kid doesn't want to do that, you know? And after they did get high together, Dean would convince him to put on handcuffs, which is also something that John Wayne Gacy would end up doing as part of his MO as well. And after he put the handcuffs on, Dean would drag him into the bedroom and Wayne would walk out of the apartment and let Dean do his thing, which he would and then murder the boy. But at this point, Wayne didn't actually know that Dean was killing the boy. Dean would actually give him the same excuses he gave to David Brooks in that he was just the child ring. I still don't understand that excuse, but shortly after Dean would find out what was happening and soon join in. Wayne's next lure would actually be his friend. Stop being friends with these people. Frank Agit. I don't know if I'm saying that right and I'm sorry if I'm not. Same as Willard Branch, Wayne would convince him to come back to Dean's apartment and Frank, trusting his friend, felt obliged. So he went, but would end up meeting the same demise as Willard, getting handcuffed and dragged back to Dean's room and then getting and then getting murdered just like he murdered all the other boys by strangulation and a pistol shot to the head. And although this shocked Dean the first time he witnessed it, he would say after he got caught that he still respected Dean after this. He said that Dean was a smart guy and he dressed really well and was smart witted. And these two boys just looked up to Dean so much, I think as a father figure that he, he just brainwashed the shit out of them even after he was already killed by the boys too. So it's unfortunate. Now around the time Wayne joined David and Coral's killer crew, Dean turned 30 and had a bit of a quarter life crisis because Dean was very self-absorbed and was very concerned about how he looked and how people perceived him. And he wanted to be younger. Shocking. Because he wanted to hang out with younger boys. Shocking. So it was around this time that he literally only hung out with teenage boys and no adults at all, except for when he had to go to work at the lighting company in Houston. So Dean, Wayne, and Brooks would have parties for these teenage boys in Dean's apartments of varying degrees. If you were 12, to 14, the parties would be candy and sodas. But if you were 15 and up, it would be grass, pills, booze, and huff and glue and paint. So essentially a perfect trap for getting and murdered by Dean and his accomplices. So more and more kids are disappearing and more and more people are finally starting to notice after, I don't even know how many at this point. I think I think we're around, around 12, but it was mostly just the friends of the boys that were noticing this at this time. And what Dean Quarrel would do to remedy this problem was to get the boys to write letters to their families before he killed them, which is something also Charles Ng and Leonard Lake, the serial killers did as well. Cause this would keep the families not suspicious if they would receive letters saying that, hey, I got a job somewhere or something else is happening, at least for a certain amount of time. One of the examples of the letter is as said, quote unquote, I'm sorry I left like I did, but I got a better job on a truck loading and unloading from Houston to Washington. We should be back within three to four weeks. I'll either call you or see you then. Love. Johnny. And this would really help the law and families get off Dean's trail for the most part. And as far as Dean's murder methods went, some boys were strangled, like I said before, some were shot and some got both. For example, one was shot in the chest and left to bleed to death in Dean's bathtub. Another got a bullet in the head from Wayne that entered his forehead and came out his ear. And the boy managed to survive this bullet wound and get out the words, Wayne, please don't. And that is when Wayne and Dean would both strangle him to death. And Another boy was shot in the jaw and was just left to bleed to death in Dean's apartment for the entire day, meanwhile also being tortured by Dean and then died eventually by strangulation from Dean. And the more Dean liked the boys, the longer he would keep them alive, which was worse in every way possible. Now I'm gonna get into some of the methods that Dean used to torture these boys. So uh, I know I put a trigger warning up in the beginning, but here's another trigger warning. If any of this is going to be triggering for you or off-putting or anything like that, please skip ahead. So viewer discretion is advised. After Dean was caught, police would eventually search Dean's apartment and they would find an 18 inch double-ended and a bunch of extremely thin glass 
rods that Dean would steal from the Houston Lighting Company. And Wayne said that Dean would shove these thin glass tubes into the boys' urethras and snap them off and leave them inside. He would also pull their pubic hairs with pliers or with his fingers or teeth. And most disturbingly, he chewed off the genitals of one boy in particular that made him very angry. Now, the victim's mouths were usually taped, but if they weren't, Dean would just crank up the music in his apartment to drown out the screams. And if you're wondering how so many boys were killed and shot in this short span of time without any of the neighbors knowing, it's because Dean moved so often, up to five to seven times a year during a three-year spree. So if a neighbor was to report him in any way, he would just leave immediately and evade suspicion. So by the summer of 1973, the trio David, Wayne, and Coral were starting to drift apart. David had gotten married to his girlfriend at the time and also got her pregnant. Oops. And soon after moved out of the Heights. And Wayne had attempted to enlist in the Navy, but was rejected because he dropped out of high school. Don't drop out of high school, kids. And Dean himself was planning on leaving Houston at the end of the summer in 1973. And we only know this information because Joe Scare, <laughs> Dean Coral's girlfriend of five years, Betty Hawkins, told us this. And looking back, Betty would have been the perfect beard for Dean for both homosexuality reasons and for murders, because he would have have a constant alibi for everything because she was uh, essentially whipped. She was a single mom, almost in her 30s, didn't have a job. So she would basically just do everything Dean told her to do. And they would not have any form of sexual relationship either, which... Flag. I mean, do you, but gu my God, my God. And even after Dean's death in 1973, Betty would still not believe that Dean did any of these murders. So you can just see how brainwashed and whipped she was from Dean as well, which is unfortunate. So in the weeks leading up to Dean's murder, he decided he wanted to go back to where his mommy lives in Boulder, Colorado. And he would tell Betty that it's not a good time to come with me, Betty, okay? I gotta go by myself. You gotta stay back here with the kids, okay? I'm not going up there to elude the police or anything or, or cause no, uh, suspicion or anything, but I just gotta go up to Colorado, okay, see my mommy breastfeed a little bit, all right? And also, if David Brooks asks where I am, do not tell him where I am, okay? Not for any particular reason, not because I think he wants to kill me or anything, just because. Now, after Wayne was caught, he mentioned that Dean may have started to become privy to the fact that Wayne and Brooks were trying to scheme against Dean and possibly kill him. He was feeling that the vibes were off, you know what I mean? And Wayne and Brooks actually did plan to kill Dean on several occasions, but to hype themselves up, they would huff paint like f***ing animals and then just pass out and then inevitably just get too tired and not kill him, which... <sighs> Why you, you do it once and then why do you do it twice? And then again, that's, but whatever. Anyway, but before Dean sensed that Wayne and Brooks wanted to turn on him and before he wanted to flee to Boulder, he would go to and reside in his father's old house in Pasadena, Texas. And this is the house that ended up being the most blood soaked out of all Dean's places. And all of these murders would happen between June 1st and August 4th, 1973. Wayne and Dean would kill eight boys, five of which were from the Heights. But ironically, Dean's inevitable end would spark from one woman, a woman named Rhonda, who was none other than Wayne's girlfriend. On the night of August 4th, 1973, Wayne brought over two male friends and Rhonda to Dean's place to partay. And this is where Dean had an absolute fit because Dean hates women. He only likes little boys, Wayne. God damn it, get it through your head. Otherwise, I'll put it through your head like I do to the boy. Sorry. Sorry. But alas, Dean would calm down and he would grab the paper bags and the paint and he would hand them out to everybody and everybody would just start because <laughs> that's what kids did back in the days. They have paint. Don't have paint, kids. Okay. But once everybody passed out, this gave Dean the opportunity to handcuff Wayne and bind him. Now, Wayne had a higher tolerance than the other people because he was always partying with Dean. So he would be huffing pain on the regular. All right, just like me. Just kidding. Never have pain in my life. Only markers. All right. I'm kidding. So Wayne would inevitably wake up earlier than the other people and he would see what Dean was doing and be like, Dean, what the f***? And he would see that the floor was now covered in plastic and that both of his friends are tied up in the corner, one of which is naked and Rhonda, which is clothed. He really didn't like women. Tim Curley would be strapped to Dean's torture board and Rhonda would be tied up with nylon rope on the floor. So Dean walked over and he turned up the radio and he got ready to do what he always did. Walking over to Wayne and saying, I'm gonna teach you a lesson, boy. But before Dean could do anything, Wayne started fast talking. He started talking his 
his way out, saying, hey, don't you remember all the cool memories we made? Remember that, that kid that we killed and we, we went and grabbed root beer floats after? Wasn't that fun? I don't know what the f he said, but he talked his way out of it. And he also said that he would kill Rhonda for Dean just to make sure that he could get out of this situation. So Dean being the sick f that he is said, all right, all right, Wayne, that's cool. He unhugged, he uncuffed him, and then he stripped off all of his own clothing, Dean this is, so he was naked. And he would walk over to Rhonda, point at her and said, get to work. And Wayne, in a rage, got up, picked up the pistol and pointed it at Dean. And Dean ran full speed at him saying, kill me. Well, why don't you just kill me then? That's the most terrifying thing I've ever thought of. A naked man just running full sprint saying, kill me. Why don't you kill me? I mean, I'd kill you. <laughs> and Wayne would do exactly that. By the time he got one foot from him, Wayne would put three bullets into Dean's chest and two into his back. I mean, I personally would do a headshot, but that's just me. And police would arrive just a few minutes later because Wayne called them. And I love this because when the police walked in and discovered Dean Coral's body on the ground, they would describe it as quote unquote, pale, puffy and flaccid. And if that isn't a description for Dean Coral, I don't know who it is. Uh, he's just a piece of shit. He's a piece of shit. And the police would find all of Dean's usual torture devices that we already mentioned, but also would discover a small wooden box with holes drilled into it. And they described it as a box that you could fit into, but if you were in there pretty uncomfortably. I don't know what kind of description that is, but obviously we know what this box was used for. And we'd also know that because multiple multiple victims' hair was found in the box as well. And what's also interesting is that Wayne spoke to the cops and he probably could have gotten off really easily, especially given how the cops did not do any due diligence in checking in on anything. Wayne could have said, hey, yeah, this guy was coming at me. I used self-defense. He obviously tied up all my friends and he would have been off clean. But Wayne was what we call an attention whore. And he literally just spewed off everything, giving them all the information about from start to finish of himself, David Brooks, and Dean. And David Brooks would get called back actually because of his father seeing this whole thing go on on the news. And he wanted David to come in and tell them all the information he knew because he knew that David Brooks had been hanging out with Dean Coral for years, not knowing that David Brooks had actually assisted in killing all of these boys. So David Brooks and Elmer Wayne Henley Jr. would go to Texas penitentiaries and they still sit there to this day. And Dean Coral would receive a veteran's funeral because he served a measly year in the army doing absolutely Absolutely nothing but molesting people most likely. But rest assured, hopefully he is burning in hell and Satan himself is using an 18 inch sandpaper on him. Sorry, but honestly. And the police would continue their streak of not really doing their due diligence when finding the bodies too. Wayne would tell them where the bodies would and it was in this boat shed with the dirt floor of the facility that we had mentioned previously. And there would be 19 bodies in this shed or that is what Wayne had claimed. But they would only dig up 17 bodies using prisoners from the local jail using metal shovels and throwing away evidence that should have been put into evidence. The whole thing was done so sloppily. They wouldn't even dig up the last two bodies because it was too hot outside and the shovels stopped working in the mud because of all the bodily fluids that were coming in with the mud. And all the bodies that were dug up were under a layer of lime and all wrapped in thick plastic sheeting. Some of which even had the boys probably passing away within the sheeting because they were found with their mouths wide open as if trying to to gasp for air. And among the bodies, they would also dig up almost perfectly preserved plastic wrapped bags of male genitalia as well. Now there were still nine bodies to be discovered, some of which would be found in a village called High Island, quite a ways from Houston. And Wayne would be the one to point them in the right direction. But one of the most messed up facts about this case is that the sheriff at the time ordered for the police to stop looking for bodies after they found the 26th body because they had broken the record of most people killed by one or more men in America. Basically, he didn't want to be the one in charge while 29 young innocent boys were murdered under his watch or under his unwatchful eye. But as time went on, there would be a record-breaking 29 bodies found and murders committed by Dean Coral and David Brooks and Elmer Wayne Henley Jr., soon to be beat out by John Wayne Gacy a few short years after with 33 murders. So that is it for the... 
fucked up story and tale of Dean Coral. I hope you enjoyed this storytelling type video. I really enjoyed doing the research for this. It took a lot more time than my other videos, but I really, really enjoyed uh, writing this and researching it and everything. So if you really like this video, let me know down in the comments below. Also, let me know down in the comments below who else you would want me to do a deep dive on or what other conspiracies or other things you'd want me to do a deep dive on and I'd be happy to do it. But for now, please like the video if you like the video and also subscribe if you haven't subscribed. This is obviously Best YouTube channel 11 and I will see your beautiful face in the next video. All right? Bye.